So here we are, right? I mean, you know, have you ever been on like a youth retreat and you have that mountaintop experience with God and then you kind of have to come back down the mountain? I think for us as adults, right? I mean, I know we can still go on retreats and Emmaus walks and stuff like that and, and maybe still feel that mountaintop experience. But for me, at least... Easter kind of creates that, right? I mean, we show up to church last week, and everything is adorned in white, and we still have some white out, but oh my gosh, it was so much more last week, wasn't it? And we don't typically do flowers here in the gathering for worship, but last week we had a bouquet of flowers here, and we had a cross up on stage that had a huge arrangement of flowers on it, another arrangement of flowers in the back, and everything was beautiful, right? And it should have been. Because last week is the week when we celebrate and remember and and realize anew what Jesus has done for us, that he really did conquer the grave for our sake. Then we kind of show up to worship the next week, and at least in here we don't have flowers anymore. It doesn't seem like there's that same buzz in the room, and we're kind of left with a, what are we supposed to do now? It's weeks like that that I become more aware than usual of the gap that I think we experience between Sunday morning and Monday morning. What I mean by that, and I think you've felt this before, and you may just not be labeling it that way, but what I mean by that is that you come to church on Sunday, this this place of rest, this place that is a sanctuary, and and we sing the songs together, and we pray the prayers, and we reflect on some scripture, and we get just a taste, right, of that hope, and of that grace, and of that love that we believe we find in Christ, and we feel rejuvenated in our relationship with God, and we believe it. It's not fake, right? We believe it, and we're bought in, and, and we can feel it, but then we wake up on Monday morning, and we just feel like there's a gap, It's this this gap between what we have experienced on Sunday that convicts us and encourages us and fills our cup and how sometime over the course of Sunday evening into Monday morning, that all seems to fade at least a little bit. And instead of the good news that we heard on Sunday morning, what's in the forefront of our minds on Monday morning is the same struggles the same hardships, the same anxieties that we woke up last Monday with. For instance, right, I'm betting that when we wake up tomorrow morning, Monday morning, and and are ready to go to work, that there will still be headlines about the racial unrest that's going on in parts of the world, right? There's still going to be wars being waged all around the world, big and small, and not to mention the personal heartache that, that we all experience in our own lives, right? We're going to wake up tomorrow morning and all of that stuff is still going to be a reality for us. There's a gap between Sunday morning and Monday. The question for us, I think this morning, is is what causes that gap? Why is that gap there? Why is that something that exists? Why is that a part of of our spiritual flow throughout the week? And I think obviously there's probably more than one thing that causes it, right? But what I want us to really hone in on this morning is one of the things that I'm pretty confident causes it, and it's doubt. I think doubt, in more ways than one, leads to us experiencing that gap. And I don't think this is a secret. I think all of you have have felt this before, that oftentimes doubt will creep back into our faith on Monday morning. And it'll lead to us kind of forgetting the good news that we heard on Sunday. For me, I think, I think doubt is, is a loaded word in a lot of faith communities. It's a word that gets used a lot, and sometimes it has a lot of shame attached to it. Like you are lesser, right, if you experience doubt in your faith. And because of that, I feel like it's really important for us this morning to define what we actually mean by doubt. So here's how I would define doubt, that thing that we experience. Doubt is when we allow the circumstances of our life to get wedged between us and God. I think that's what doubt is. Doubt is when we allow the circumstances of our life to get wedged between us and God. The reason that I really like this definition of doubt 
is because I think it leaves room for us to realize that all of us will probably, in some season of life, experience doubt. Who knows what those wedges will be, right? But I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves along our faith's journey, at some point in time will experience a season where we begin to doubt and we begin to question our faith at least just a little bit because of something that has been wedged between us and God. It could be all sorts of stuff. It could be losing a loved one. It could be a bad car accident. It could be some sort of addiction that's having an impact on your life. It could be losing your job unexpectedly or or marital trouble or just a season of loneliness. It could be a whole host of different things. But if we're honest with ourselves, in certain seasons of life, stuff gets wedged between us and God. And the truth is, churches aren't always the best at helping folks like us through those seasons of doubt, right? Pastors are often the worst about it, if I'm being honest. I think for some reason, so many people are intimidated by doubt, and it leads to pastors saying really confusing things about seasons of doubt. Things like, if we doubt that we're not being faithful, or it leads to shaming people for doubting, or or it leads to churches communicating things like, you won't be fully healed if you don't rid yourself of of this doubt. Or a message like, you haven't been fully blessed by God because there's still some doubt in your heart about whether or not God can actually do this for you. And I I think all of that rhetoric, all of that language around doubt, it really boils down to this, that for some reason, for a lot of people out there, a lot of churches out there are convinced that doubt marks the end of faith. And that understanding of doubt, I think, just leads folks to push down the doubt that they're experiencing, to not deal with it, to not let it breathe, to deny it, and to hide it, because they believe that, that if, if they actually deal with it, if they actually face it head on, if heaven forbid they actually take it to God and, and are honest about what they are feeling and what they are experiencing in their faith, then that will separate them from God and, and that it could, it could actually end their faith. But the truth is, and I I think you know this, that if that's how we treat doubt, if all we do with our doubt is push it down and hide it and deny it and act like it's not there and pretend like everything is rosy and fine on the surface, the only thing that is going to do for us as a people of faith is make that gap between Sunday and Monday grow bigger and bigger and bigger. I think doubt is a really hard thing for us to avoid in the world that we live in and in the world that we seek to believe in. It's why I'm convicted, and it's a reason why I mention it every single week in my welcome when we gather for worship here on Sunday mornings, to make sure that here in this space, we don't treat doubt as taboo, but rather as simply a part of the faith journey that we are all on together. Because I don't think that doubt marks the end of our faith. I don't think that a season of doubt means that we're entering the land of no return. I think if handled correctly, doubt can be the beginning of a new chapter. And I actually think that those who doubt and are willing to take that doubt to God actually end up being the most faithful of all. This morning, we're going to look at John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. If you were here last week, then we are actually picking up with the very next verse that we left off of when we were reading the resurrection of count out of the gospel of John. And this is the passage where we get to hear the story of who I think is the most famous doubter of all time. Let's read it together. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, And the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say together. Sorry, friends, I'm fighting some allergies, so. This is the same day, like I already said, right? We're picking up with the very next verse that we left off of last week on Resurrection Sunday. This is the same day that Jesus has appeared to Mary Magdalene and to Peter and to John at the tomb. This is the same day that they found the tomb empty. It was just earlier this morning. This is the day of the resurrection. And Jesus has already made his way to the house where the disciples have locked themselves in in fear of what those Jewish authorities would do to them in the wake of them crucifying Jesus. And Jesus walks in and he says, peace be with you. And he immediately, right, shows them his hands and shows them his sides and the disciples believe and they begin to rejoice because they know now that he has actually risen but thomas thomas wasn't there when jesus first appeared to the disciples so he hears of the resurrection second hand so thomas is kind of like us isn't he He's like you and like me. He hears of the resurrection through secondhand news. Somebody else tells him that Jesus is risen. He doesn't actually get the chance to see Jesus with his own eyes. So Thomas is told by some of the disciples that finally come and find him after they have this encounter with Jesus that he's risen. And and here comes the doubt, right? Thomas says what I think most of us would say in this moment if we're being totally honest with ourselves. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I won't believe. Thomas is saying what I think Thomas is saying. Even though I want to believe he is risen, I do. Trust me, I do. I want this to be true, but I'm doubting and I really need something to prove this to me. I would like to believe it, but for some reason, I I just can't. I've been asking myself this week, why was Thomas not with that larger group of disciples when Jesus first appeared? Why was he the only one that wasn't in the room, the only one that didn't get to see firsthand in that close group of Jesus' followers that he was actually risen and we don't find the answer in the scriptures. I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I have a few speculations, right? I mean, and part of me wonders if it was just too painful for him to be with them in that moment. That instead, maybe he felt like he needed to be alone so that he could grieve and weep the death of his Savior. Part of me wonders what Thomas had allowed to become wedged between him and Jesus. Part of me wonders if he had felt some shame. If he had felt like that now that the gig was up and he had felt like he had turned his back on Christ, that it was time for him to get out of town, that he didn't even really feel worthy of being a part of this group of believers like he once was. If we fast forward a little bit, we see that the disciples are back in the house and Thomas is with them this time. And did you catch that sneaky thing that John threw in about how the door was shut but Jesus appeared in the room anyway? I love that so much. I don't know what it means. I don't know if he walked through a wall or what, but I think that is so cool, right? Jesus comes in, and he goes straight to Thomas, doesn't he? He doesn't waste any time. I mean, he gives the same greeting. He says, peace be with you, and then he goes straight for Thomas. And he doesn't belittle him. 
He doesn't ask him why he wasn't there that day when he appeared to the rest of the disciples. He doesn't criticize him. He doesn't ask him why he doesn't believe, right? He does none of that. Instead, Jesus looks at Thomas and says, look, look, friend, here's, here's how we're going to close that gap just a little bit that you're experiencing right now. I want you to stick your hands in my side. I want you to stick your hands right in the wounds that you know the centurions left in my side. I want you to take your fingers and I want you to feel the holes that were left by the nails that put me up on the cross so that you will know too that I am risen. And Thomas does this. And sure enough, it works, doesn't it? He doesn't doubt anymore. Instead, he believes, my Lord, my God, he says. That's his response. I mean, Thomas all of a sudden can see for himself that this is real, that Jesus is actually risen. Here's something that I realized this week looking at this text and and, and thinking about where we find ourselves, oftentimes in a similar place to Thomas with kind of this lifelong wrestling match that we have with doubt. Thomas doesn't truly experience the risen Christ until he puts his hands into the most painful, into the most hurt, into the most torn up parts of Christ's body, the holes from the nails and the wound on his side. Thomas doesn't truly believe the risen Christ until he experiences for himself the most hurt parts of Christ's body, which poses a really challenging question for us, doesn't it? If we find ourselves in the midst of a season of doubt, we can't just go and do what Thomas is able to do, can we? How are we supposed to work through our doubt if it looks like for one of the disciples what it took was physically touching the wounds that the cross left on Jesus' body? How are we supposed to get rid of those wedges if, if if we can't do that? How do we make doubt the beginning of a new chapter? rather than the end of the story. Well, we can't touch the holes on his palms, can we? We can't stick our hand in the wounds in the side of Christ. We can't do what Thomas gets to do to work through our doubt. So what do we do? How do we get to the end? How do we make it through a season of doubt? I remembered this week what Paul says in First. Corinthians, and it kind of helped me discern what I think the answer to that question is. Paul says this, now you are the body of Christ, and individually you are members of it. You've heard this before, right? It's a part of a big rant that Paul goes on talking about how we're each individually members of Christ's body, and we're not all the same, but we're all important, and some are hands and some are feet, right? You know this. Now we are all members of Christ's body, individually members of it. And here's what I realized. We may not be able to physically touch the wounds on the body of Christ, but there are members of Christ's body all around us that are hurting. There are members of the body of Christ all around us who are scared, who are hungry, who are sick, who are tired, who are lonely. I realized this week that if we, like Thomas, are doubting, if we are feeling that Sunday to Monday gap more than usual, then Jesus is really saying the same thing to us that he was saying to Thomas. Let's close that gap together. Touch my sides. Put your fingers in the holes that the nails left. Pick up the phone and call someone who you know is hurting. Write notes to folks who you know are lonely and they just need to be reminded that God is with them. Support those in need, the homeless and the needy, by giving what you can and showing up where you can show up. Invest in your family more than you ever have. Wave at your neighbors so that they know they're not alone. If you're in a season of doubt this Sunday after Easter, if there are some wedges that have found themselves between where you are and where God is, then I want you to know that Jesus is telling you the same thing thing that he told Thomas. Get your hands on and invest in the members of my body that are hurting the most, and that's where you'll find me. And I think that's how we work through our doubt. 
because we believe that Christ is always closest to those who are brokenhearted. Just look at the way he lived his life, who he ate with, who he called, who he healed. Friends, when you find yourself in seasons of doubt, I think Christ is telling us the same thing he told Thomas. Stick your hands in the holes that were left by the nails. Put your hand in the wound that was left on my side. And that is where I'll be. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for tuning into our message this week in the gathering. We hope you found it meaningful and life-giving. As always, you're invited to join us for worship on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., either in person here in the chapel or online. If you want to know more about who we are at Bluff Park United Methodist Church, you're invited to check out our website. There you'll find out who we are, what we have going on, and how you can be a part of it. As always, friends, if there's anything that we can do for you, you're invited to reach out to us. We are here to help you and support you in any way that we can. We hope that you're having a great week, and we look forward to seeing you soon.